Welcome to The Index, a podcast by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Now, this series delves into the Global Organized Crime Index and takes a look at some of the biggest threats facing countries and regions around the world. I'm your host, Danlea Wynn. Now, in the last episode, I spoke to Sangeeta and Christina about financial crimes, which is a new category for the upcoming edition of the Global Organized Crime Index. Well, today we have a bonus episode with someone who has decades of first-hand experience dealing with these crimes. Joining me for this discussion is Nick Lewis, Managing Director at the Standard Charter Bank, dealing with the financial crime compliance issues. Now, Nick has been in law enforcement since 1982 when he joined North Wales Police. And since then, he has been with a serious organized crime agency in the UK and a senior diplomat dealing with transnational organized crime threats. In 2014, Nick was awarded an OBE for services to international law and order. Nick, welcome to the Index. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, what do you think of the fact that financial crimes is going to be a category in the Global Organized Crime Index? I think this is a really positive development. When we think of financial crime and we think of commodities being trafficked around the world, whether those commodities are drugs or guns or or even people, the vast majority of these crimes are financially driven and they're committed by people seeking to make money from those crimes. And so the addition of financial crimes into the index, I think, really reflects the importance that money plays in the global organized crime trade. Do you have any recommendations to the researchers on what they should be looking out for? Sure. I'm I'm really proud to have been involved with the Global Initiative since the very early days. And the work that the Global Initiative does to highlight the issue of transnational organized crime is increasingly important and increasingly respected by governments as well as by the private sector and the third sector around the world. Inclusion of financial crime and, and illicit finance in the index gives our researchers, I think, an opportunity to think about the whole continuum of organised crime in a way that perhaps we haven't done before. So what happens to all the dirty money that's generated from the crimes? You know, Traditionally, we think about the crimes, and quite rightly, we think wherever we can through the lens of victims. The law enforcement effort is very focused towards the perpetrators. The private sector, we play a slightly you know, different role, and in the financial sector in particular, Bad guys put their money through financial institutions in order to move that money around the world, in order to launder it, and in order to be able to spend it at the end of that process. And I think, for me, it's always been a glaring omission from the index. What I think researchers need to be alive to is there are licit, completely legal uses of the financial infrastructure and the financial system which are exploited by bad guys in order to to launder their money. But there are also out-and-out criminal activities where where criminals are seeking to to exploit the financial system, but also to make money from the financial system itself. So, So the financial sector, the private sector, they can be victims in all of this as well as facilitators in all of this. The financial sector has made huge strides over the past five, 10 years in taking responsibility for the role that the financial sector plays in global money laundering and illicit financial trade. And I think there are some some great initiatives going on around the world where the where the financial sector and the private sector more widely are really stepping up to the mark and, and behaving like responsible citizens. But I think there's also a danger in the world of academia and often in the in the think tank world where elements of the global financial system are frowned upon and deemed to be bad just by virtue of them facilitating very wealthy people to do things with their money. And, and, you know, I highlight often in our conversations at GI Talk that global offshore financial centres are not, by definition, illegal. They are exploited in some ways by bad guys but that doesn't make everything that they do bad. So I think just some warnings there for researchers about trying to separate the bad from the good within the world of financial crime. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I'm particularly struck 
by your answer around how that has been a glaring omission, the fact that financial crimes weren't part of it. And my day job is as a journalist. And one of the things we were told was follow the money, right? If you want to know what's going on. So that's a, that's a really good point. You've been doing this now for decades, like I said. How have financial crimes evolved over the years? What are the, the new trends that you're seeing? Well, I think there's, there's two main areas that I would focus on here. And, and one is simply the evolution of the financial system through which the bad guys move their money. So the whole anti-money laundering sort of agenda was put together in the sort of early 80s to place an obligation on the financial sector to identify money which looked dodgy and to give law enforcement an opportunity to do something about it. And the system was developed and designed when it literally took three days for money to move from one account to another. So if I was to send you money 40 years ago, I could send it today, but it wouldn't show in your account until you know Monday next week. And that genuinely gave law enforcement an opportunity to do something about it. Now, today, money can move in milliseconds, and it can move around the world. It can bounce through multiple jurisdictions, in and out of secrecy jurisdictions and offshore centers. It can move across multitude of different financial institutions and financial instruments in a matter of seconds, in a way that makes it almost impossible to trace and follow and track that money. So the old adage of follow the money, it still rings true in one dimension of you know, bad guys making money and spending that money on fast cars, fast boats, aeroplanes, etc. It's fairly easy to follow that. But properly laundered money, intelligently laundered money is incredibly difficult to follow around the world. So the environment in which we are trying to find that dirty money has changed beyond all recognition and legislation and requirements have not kept pace with that. The second area, I think, that has really changed over those decades is you know, the introduction of technology and the introduction of new payment methods of cryptocurrencies, the exploitation of things like non-fungible tokens, the laundering of money in the metaverse. All of these things were unthinkable, couldn't even have begun to imagine them when I started out in this game. But those are the environments in which we, we have to operate now. And of course, criminals, as we know, are incredibly adept at not just adapting to changing environments and opportunities, but creating opportunities for new technology to be used to bad effect. And we see that now, of course, in, in the world of AI, generative AI and large language models, where we are seeing criminals actively using this technology to their advantage and to defeat law enforcement. I think one area where I'm really disappointed we haven't made more progress is in the area of cross-border information sharing to tackle crime and to tackle financial crime. The really big dirty money crosses borders multiple times between the generation of the funds and the spending of the funds. We still don't have an effective global response to that. We are still hampered both in the private sector and in the public sector, in the law enforcement sector, by the existence of national borders and by the requirement for sovereignty for each nation to deal with the problem as they see fit. That is absolutely hindering the fight against financial crime. It is enabling criminals to, to both exploit weaknesses, but also to target weaknesses in a way that gives them a much more significant advantage than they would have had 30, 40 years ago. I want to actually follow up on, on one of the things you said earlier, particularly how things are now moving so fast when it comes to these kind of crimes. We are also reading these days lots of stories, right, about financial scams and credit card frauds that seems to be happening across border as well. And they seem to have become increasingly sophisticated. You know, would they also be considered financial crimes or are they cyber crimes? Or I mean, where, where do they where do they fall into? So we, we don't have a sort of a common definition. In, in the financial sector, we tend to refer to financial crime as money laundering, financing of terrorism, evasion of sanctions, bribery and corruption, proliferation financing. And it's only really in the last three or four years that we've started 
universally including fraud in that definition. Of course, fraud was always captured. Scams and fraud were always captured because as soon as a fraud or a scam is perpetrated and money is taken from a victim, that money then becomes proceeds of crime, which is then captured by the financial industry's response to money laundering. But increasingly, we've got more and more engaged in fraud prevention, in doing as much as we can to protect our clients from fraud, as well as, of course, lots of public-private partnership work to identify the proceeds of fraud and then work with different governments to repatriate wherever we can those proceeds so that they can be given back to the victims. This is a question that I asked the previous speakers as well, and I want to ask you as well. In 2018, this report, The True Cost of Financial Crime, revealed that companies had suffered losses of $1.45 trillion to financial crime. I mean, that sounds like a lot. You know, Can you sort of put that in context for many of us who perhaps just get lost in the zeros once you you know, stack we be on millions, hundreds of millions, essentially. I'm not sure I can. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a banker in, in that sense. 1.45 trillion sounds like a lot of money. And of course, it is a huge amount of money. But factor that in against the loss to governments through public sector fraud. You add all of these things together, you know, the amount of money that was lost by governments during COVID through scams perpetrated against the public purse across the world, not just in the UK, but every country that operated some sort of publicly funded scheme to alleviate the impact of COVID suffered huge fraud and huge losses. But what I would say just to sort of maybe give a little bit of balance to that that yes, the private sector lost $1.45 trillion. And of course, for the private sector, you have to think about every single thing that is not the government. And so that could be frauds against banks, it could be mortgage fraud, it could be selling a, a car that's on higher purchase before the loan has been repaid. There are a whole bunch of crimes that fall into that category. But overall, about 4% of the world's global GDP is considered to be dirty money at any one point. So the 1.45 trillion pales into insignificance against the total volume of dirty money that we think is sloshing around in the system. In the UK, banks in the UK spent £34 billion last year just operating financial crime compliance activities. That's just one sector of the private sector in one country. And to put that figure thin into context, that is about three quarters of the UK defence budget. So the private sector is spending far, far, far more money than it ever did to tackle this problem. Now, part of the challenge here, and this is where bodies like the GI and the Global Index become really, really important in shining a light on the policy challenges that we have, the UK GDP, and I'll pick the UK because obviously that's where I'm sitting at the moment. The UK GDP for last year was £2,500 billion. £34 billion was the amount that UK banks spent on financial crime compliance. And of course, if we took that 4% of GDP is dirty money, then the financial sector alone is spending £1 in the UK for every £3 of dirty money that's sloshing around in the system, and we're spending that money trying to find it. Now, that maybe gives you some indication of how difficult it is to find this money. And that's, that's money that a large amount of that is discretionary spending. The banks, we have a regulatory obligation to have a financial crime detection system in place, but it's largely up to us how much we spend on that and what we ask it to do. And you know, in the UK, a lot of the financial institutions are involved in a lot of voluntary work with the National Crime Agency and with others, His Majesty's Revenue and Customs, in actually trying to hunt down the dirty money in the system, hunt down the bad actors who are exploiting the financial system. Because of course, they make the system weak and dangerous and vulnerable for all the good people. And we see that increasingly in the private sector as part of our moral responsibility. The banks never get a good press, you know, and almost certainly never will. But I, from the privileged position I sit in, 
I can see the huge amount of additional voluntary work that is way beyond our regulatory requirements and expectations that we do to provide high quality intelligence to law enforcement agencies around the world. And I also see the positive results that come from that. I see the operations that law enforcement agencies put together across multiple jurisdictions as a result of information provided by the private sector and by the financial sector. So, you know, 1.45 trillion. If you look at it from the context of you or I with what we've got in our bank accounts, that's a huge volume of money. If you look at it in the context of, you know, 4% of global GDP, it's not really very much at all. Yeah. And it feels like, and I think you alluded to that a little bit earlier as well, like we're now only finally coming to grips with how serious this issue is. Why Why do you think it has taken quite a while? Maybe, you know, financial institutions um, have a bit of a head start in, in a sense that this is their role and their responsibility to, to do this, right? But I think in terms of even governments or ordinary consumers or others, um, will find me sort of understanding the scale of it. Why do you think it has taken quite a while? I'm not sure that it's taken that long to understand the scale of it, but it definitely has taken too long to respond to the scale of it. And that has largely been down to reputation of the private sector and a lack of institutional trust between the public and the private sectors. You know, I remember when I came out of law enforcement and joined the private sector, there were lots of jokes about, you know, going to the dark side and selling my soul to the devil. But, you know, what I've been able to achieve and what many institutions have been able to achieve by hiring people from public sector backgrounds is we've been able to break down that trust deficit that sat between the public and the private sector. And pretty much everywhere I go now, I see much improved relationships between law enforcement and banks, and not just banks, telecoms companies, internet providers, the vast majority of people are trying to do the right thing in this space. And so that absence of trust was definitely getting in the way. Now, as we've chipped away at that, private sector has been able to demonstrate to the public sector and to law enforcement that we can be trusted that we have systems and processes in place, and more important, that we are keen and eager to support law enforcement operations. We're keen to expose the bad guys, not least because they introduce risk into our banks, and that makes our clients' money vulnerable. Our clients are citizens of countries around the world. Of course they are. And so protecting citizens, which is the first duty of any government, and protecting clients is the same mission, right? But what we've increasingly come to realize is that the amount of information that is held in the private sector, which is relevant and useful to understanding the nature, the scale of threats and how those threats are perpetrated, and also who are the bad actors behind those threats, is something that was never properly understood in the private sector. So the work we've been doing over the last few years, collectively, public and private sectors working together, is... How do we unlock that information in the right circumstances in a way that protects the rights and privacy of good clients, but exposes the activities and the intelligence about those bad clients? And how do we use that information to greater effect? And as I've seen these types of relationships build around the world, we keep going further and further. In the UK, we have a tremendous relationship between the Home Office and the Treasury and the financial sector, where we've been working on changing legislation, improving legislation, making sure that the rights of good clients and innocent clients are fully protected, whilst at the same time enabling as much information sharing as we possibly can about bad guys. And we're beginning to see, you know, we've got some really powerful legislation going through Parliament at the moment in the UK, which will really change the game. We couldn't have done that a few years ago because we couldn't have sat down in a meeting with government officials and spoken openly about how private sector might contribute to understanding this problem. And we certainly couldn't have sat down and expected law enforcement to tell us who they were investigating. Now, of course, as soon as law enforcement can get comfortable telling us who it is they are investigating or what it is they're investigating, then we can go to our files and find relevant information to support that work. 
Yeah, that's really fascinating to hear how, you know, the inner workings of how the cooperation works. You spoke earlier about the fact that laws perhaps haven't kept up pace with, you know, the changes in financial crimes and also, you know, the lack of sort of cross-border information sharing. What else do you see as things that still need to do to combat this effectively? So we have a we have a suite of conventions that have been introduced through the United Nations where member states sign up to do as much as they possibly can, whatever set out in those individual treaties to tackle global problems, whether it's organized crime, whether it's corruption, etc. The majority of those are fairly old and countries signed up to them and then have done very little proactive since then to actually think about are we keeping pace with technology? Are we keeping pace with the criminals? Are we responding quickly enough to changing crime types? And so I think one of the things that we definitely need to do is we need to keep refreshing that appetite to collaborate and to cooperate. Far too often we sign up to something or we endorse an idea or a plan and then not enough is done then to to follow up on that and really do something that makes a difference. And what we must always remember with financial crimes is you know, and the clues in the name, it's all about the money. So the vast majority of dirty money that's in the legitimate financial system, you know, the public financial system, can be linked back to crimes and back to criminals. The difficulty for all of us, whether we're working in law enforcement, whether we're working in the private sector, is how do we find that money amongst the hundreds of billions of pounds that are sloshing around every day between bank accounts? And of course, you know, we look for indicators, we look for red flags, we look for something about a particular transaction that looks strange and unusual, and then we investigate it. Well, of course, that's a real needle in a haystack approach. So I think going forward, we need to really, really invest in data, we need to invest in big data solutions, data solutions that are agnostic to borders. And we need to find a way to do that in a way using technology such as you know, privacy enhancing technologies, etc. We need to do it in a way where we can interrogate and analyze data without ever actually knowing who that data refers to. We have to protect the privacy of good people in this. And of course, in order to find that anomalous transaction, we need to look at everybody's transactions, including all the good people, because it's only by comparing suspicious transactions to non-suspicious transactions that we can define the suspicion. So we need to look at everybody's data. And that's a huge challenge. That data, that privacy versus security challenge is a huge challenge, not just in the financial crime space. This goes across the national security space and across the organized crime space. So we must stop thinking about this in the splendid isolation of financial crime. We must start thinking about this as not just national security threats, but global security threats. And Every government, every economy around the world depends on a robust and successful economy and therefore economic system to prosper. So whilst we're looking to we're spending all this money looking for the bad actors and the bad money, we've got to be careful that we don't inadvertently impact on global trade, on the amount of money that supports legitimate businesses and legitimate people. That's a real big challenge. And and how we convene that sort of conversation is really difficult because it has to be every country. And as we know, we can see today, and many of your listeners will be very familiar with, there are countries in the world right now doing things right now that would mean we don't want to invite them into that conversation. We don't trust them enough. They've not shown themselves to be responsible actors. We don't want to invite them into that conversation. And we certainly don't want to tell them what we know about the criminal activities in their country unless we're certain that's not going to be abused and exploited. So these are big policy conversations and organisations like GI Talk have increasingly become the convening power that can enable these conversations to take place. And and as I say, I'm incredibly proud to to be involved with GI Talk and I know that when they speak, people listen and, and we must not underestimate the power of a conversation from a neutral party. And I think that's where I would be putting my effort in the next few years. Nick, thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you. That's all we have time for this episode of The Index. Thank you so much, Nick, for this fascinating discussion on financial crimes. 
Remember that in the podcast note, you'll find links to country profiles that are discussed in this episode. In addition to that, you'll also find a link to the Global Organized Crime Index, which lists 193 countries around the world and scores their levels of criminality and resilience. It's a totally free resource and available to everyone. Just head over to ocindex.net. That's it for this episode of The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Thin Lewin. Thanks for listening.